thank you to a wonderful panel with some excellent insights into the changing nature of the media. We have another panel who are just about to be mic'd up, so the changing of the mics is taking place. Um, while that's happening, just want to mention a couple of things. So the next panel is also an interactive panel. After that, there'll be morning tea. While morning tea is taking place, if you are an ECR, we uh, encourage you to meet Sophie Lewis. Sophie, can you stand up, please? Sophie is our ECR representative on the STA Council and uh, we would like you to come and meet her and chat to her about how STA can work for you as an early career researcher. Uh, another thing is also if you are a member of a cluster, uh, there is, uh, it should be written on the bottom underneath your name. So if you want to cluster with your cluster, this is how you work it out. Um, so our next session this morning, we have microphones on people, yep is the art of the political meeting. So we have heard how to get your story out into the public and into the media, but often the art of influencing is uh, about doing it behind closed doors, in meetings, over a coffee. So our next session, rather than being about getting your story out or your evidence out, is about getting it under the nose of politicians in a, a rather subdued manner, um, but often more effectively. So directly sneaking in and whispering in the ear of the bureaucrats and politicians. Now, I'm not suggesting there's anything sneaky about this panel. We have another incredibly experienced and influential group here and very privileged to have them speak to us today. The chair of the panel, Martin Lavery, is currently CEO of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. He's also been CEO of the Catholic Health Australia. He's on quite a few boards, foundations and government advisory committees. He's also a constitutional lawyer. He will be joined by Jeanette Cottrell and Simon Banks, two of the most influential communications advisors and specialists, lobbyists and government relations people. Janet is Managing Director of Executive Council Australia and Simon Banks is Managing Director of Hawker Britain. Simon also has been Chief of Staff or Deputy Chief of Staff to three federal Labor leaders. Um, I think that was over a three month period. No, <laughs> no it's okay. Um, and Director of Labor policies. He's also a public commentator. So I'll introduce you to Martin, who can do the rest. Friends, uh, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal, the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, and I welcome you all to Canberra. Now, as you know, Canberra is a relatively rowdy town, and our two panellists this morning are themselves very familiar with the rowdiness of the parliamentary process. So during our discussion, I'm going to invite you to interject, to boo, to cheer at any stage. If there's something said that you like, a good hear, hear, or a shame if we get out of order. Now, while we're going, I will invite questions uh, without notice at any time. And as the speaker today, I will uh, exercise my authority to <laughs> silence the member for so-and-so and take the question, even if it's in breach of proceeding orders from the floor. So those carrying the microphones around the room, please be attentive to the need for the scientists in this room to jump to their feet and put a question to our two very talented panellists. Well, hasn't it been an extraordinary time in politics over the course of the last six or seven years? Australia, the country of the fair go, once upon a time guaranteed that a government had two terms. Queensland, Victoria, and perhaps federally, we now have to question if indeed a government is guaranteed two terms in which to implement their agenda. If political uncertainty exists such that the Prime Minister or the Premier of the day can't guarantee their own tenure in office, how is it that good folk like lobbyists can go about their job of influencing the political process while it's in turmoil. Today we're going to talk about the current political environment and what instability means for communicating your message on behalf of your research. But we're also going to talk about the very practical things about how you should conduct your meeting when you meet with MPs and Senators tomorrow. I'll ask our panellists what is a good meeting and indeed what is a bad meeting. So to start at the big pictures first, why is it that governments can no longer guarantee two terms in office? Is the Abbott government likely to be able to regain the confidence of the electorate 
and achieve a second term? What could the Abbott government do to win back a second term? Or has politics changed? Jeanette, I might start with you. Why are we now looking at one-term governments? Well, I think the public are unforgiving. And we've learned through, I guess, some chaos with the Labor Party and uh, the behaviour of perhaps the Newman government. The public are ready to punish those they do not believe are standing up for their rights and they, that they do believe have broken promises or that are doing things against their interest. Where once before they would say, OK, you've just got in, we've given you a big majority and I'm thinking about the Newman government now and we'll let you continue for a second term. Now they say, you know what, we don't like what you say and how you say it and you're out. And they're very unforgiving. And I think that has made the governments, I mean, the governments that have tried big reforms have failed, unfortunately. And uh, I'm sure Simon can talk about the great days of Keating and Hawke when reform was achieved and it was unanimous and it was successful. These days, big reform is really hard to do. And it's really hard to do if you don't have the public on side. So should we be blaming those pesky journalists that just spoke to us? Has that speeding up that James spoke about impacted the way in which politics now has to be conducted? Oh, I think, look, the media does have a role to play. I mean, to be honest, it's all about politics. Anybody who thinks it's about good policy is kidding themselves. It's about politics, politics, politics. And the media play to that. As I heard James say, you know, conflict is what attracts people. It also is what drives politics. Um, so that's a, it's a shame, it's shallow, it's, it's vacuous, but that is the game that you're in right now. And it's, I think for this, this organisation, it must be very frustrating to know that the environment in which you now have to manage and navigate is very turbulent, is very unexpected. It's, you know, the rule book has long been thrown out um, and I think governments themselves are struggling to know how to get back online. And I think communities are very uh, unforgiving and I think However, there is an opportunity, particularly for this audience, is that this is a really good time to ask for things. Simon, what uh, do people in this room need to do in this period of political instability? How do you get your message through when governments themselves are so preoccupied internally on their own affairs rather than perhaps the good governance of the country? Yeah, look, I guess I'm a little less pessimistic than Jeanette is about the state of affairs. I actually think what's going on in politics is something a little bit more fundamental. Um, Australian politics used to be a bit like uh, kind of the supermarket wars. It used to be basically Coles and Woolies. You had, you know, these two big incumbents who used to compete, who had a, a domination in the market, and that was the end of it. The reality is, is that uh, changes in technology, changes in communication, uh, mean that that market dominance has broken down. We now, if you like, have uh, you know the Aldis and others competing you know head to head in that part of uh, part of the market, uh, and obviously parties like the Greens, for example, would would form that kind of a grouping. But we increasingly have you know the ability of the consumer to go and shop online, uh, and that's why we get all these sort of micro parties forming in the Senate. That's what's really going on. The interesting thing about that is that uh, you know, political parties are, and organisations that try and rely upon, I guess, old-fashioned communication techniques to get their message across, just try and think, well, if I just go down the Commonwealth Club and have a quiet chat with a departmental secretary or with a minister or a shadow minister, all of my problems are going to be solved, uh, I think are going to fundamentally fail. What you actually need to do is engage in a very broad and diverse conversation. And if you look, in fact, at some of the campaigns that are starting to be uh, very successful, um, and in their own way, for example, the recent campaign both in Queensland and in Victoria for the Australian Labor Party started to show how some of this is, is re-manifesting itself, is that uh, rather than just relying upon mass communication techniques through uh, you know, the media, television and those sorts of things, as important as those things are, what social media has started to do is reconnect uh, organisations, and particularly I think the trade union movement's been very effective at this, has reconnecting organisations back to their grassroots membership and getting them to go and have conversations, not just with politicians uh, and influence makers, but with their fellow citizens about the issues that matter to them. That is actually the really big power that is transforming politics at the moment. And I say it's making it very hard for the traditional political models. But it's that ability of ordinary people to go and speak to their fellow citizen in their street, in their home, down the shopping centre, at the town hall, online, 
Uh, those are the conversations that are starting to transform politics. And I would say to the scientific community, just as I'd say to any other community, you've got lots of people that are interested in what you do. You've got the modern technology enables you better than ever before to go out and reach those people and have conversations with them and to motivate them. The harder part then starts to be converting those conversations into people who are disinterested or less interested in what you've got. That's the sort of the real challenge in modern communication speak. But I actually think for, a, for a groups like scientists, I actually think the future holds greater opportunity, not less. I wonder if um, a Liberal and Labor are Coles and Woolies, where would uh, the Palmer United Party fit in your analogy? <laughs> uh, well, look, P Palmer's kind of like, you know, like he's, he's, the, he's the guy who comes along with a new business model who just sort of, you know, sets up on the corner store and sees how he goes. Some of those guys are going to succeed and some of those people are going to fail. I think one of the interesting things that's going on in politics at the moment is that I guess for a while we've, you know, other than the Labor Party, we've tended to have another significant centre-left party and that's either been the Australian Democrats or the Australian Greens. One of the things we haven't really had in Australian politics is a significant centre-right party. Uh, now, Pauline Hanson had a crack at that uh, obviously, you know, 15 or so years ago. Clive's having a bit of a crack at that now. Neither of those are ultimately <coughs> proving successful. But if you look around people like, you know, a David Leonhelm from the LDP um, or a Nick Xenophon or others, there are people who are starting to play more creatively in that centre-right space. I, I think there will be a political movement that will form uh, somewhere there. I just don't think we've quite found out what that is yet. Now again, friends, I'll invite your questions from the floor. We have one over here. Hello, my name's Diane Jolly. I'm a chemist. Um, one of the things I've been interested in is, after listening to James talk earlier, and just something that you've spoken now about, Simon, is about how we can approach our local members and what we can do. Mm. A lot of what we've heard about this morning is how to be reactive and how to, to, to respond to things that are happening. One of the things that we don't do well is being really proactive. How do we, can you suggest to us ways that we can actually be a lot more proactive to get ourselves out there because we don't want to just be convincing people we're good. We want them to be able to see that we're good. Um, and how do, what, what strategies can you suggest for us to do that? Jeanette, can I ask you to take that and perhaps expand it beyond the individual MP to this <coughs> notion of how you campaign in an organised manner, perhaps across the nation to get mm. something done? Um, that's a very good question because I think uh, a lot of organisations don't use their local members well enough. They also forget that the story that they've come to the table is really interesting. And I think when I run campaigns, I design them and explain, find out from the client what is their true perceptual equities? What do they bring to the table that nobody else can that's really important to that person you're trying to influence? whether it's a decision maker trying to make good things happen with government or bad things go away. So it's understanding what you alone can bring to the table. It's appreciating that. It's also understanding what the new fronts and issues that you can also develop. And it's about um, ensuring that there is a political cost to ignoring your point of view. And if you get th those three things going, that becomes a very good campaign. And you have to, I mean, the best campaigns are disciplined, they're highly motivated and they're only as good as the members put in generally because they are, you know, most organisations are resource poor. So if as a community you came together, um, and we've seen that with the, the community that came together to really push for the future fund, you have to show the government if you want something, particularly want something to be created like the Science Future Fund, that there is a cost of not listening to you. And that is about understanding that if you take away what you bring to the table, if you take science off the table, if you stop transforming lives, if you stop developing great medicines, the government will listen to you. But you have to let them know that that's what you're going to do. So I always say you can run very respectful campaigns but be very tough as well. You tell the government what you're doing before you do it, as you're doing it and after you're doing it. And particularly with influencing uh, local members. If you know, like I do some work with... Uh, uh, a science institute. Now we know the local member's best friend has Parkinson. So we relate that relationship very strongly to Parkinson's. The personally salient information is what really works with MPs. I mean it's like humans isn't it Simon? If yeah. you have a personal vested interest in it then you're more likely to be motivated to support that person who's talking to you. And I, I'm working with a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies. 
We now know when we go to talk to an MP, I'll do a quick search to see whether they've got cancer in their, in their background, whether someone they know has died of cancer, whether they personally have had an experience with cancer, and that's, that's the whole tone for that conversation. And it makes it a much more effective way of getting your message through. If it's personally salient, if it covers your perceptual equities that you alone bring to the table, and also have the stakeholders, have other people who support you, not just be a lone wolf. Let's draw out that notion of the Medical Research Super Fund a little, Future Fund a little further. As you know, that $20 million was promised for the Medical Research um, Future Fund, but it was tied to the GP co-payment. So a few questions for our panel. Do we think now that the co-payment is looking like it's not coming? Is the Future Fund going to see the light of day? And more importantly, should funding for research be tied to the notion of increased taxes? And if not, how indeed do you fund them? Well, you've got to pay for it somehow. Look, um, the GP tax in the form in which it was proposed in last year's budget or even uh, at, towards the end of last year, I think is dead. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, there is one component which uh, essentially has survived, which is the freezing of rebate to uh, doctors, uh, and that will continue, and that will be a source of income uh, into the uh, medical research uh, future fund. Uh, the government obviously has also more broadly uh, flagged that other savings in health might be tagged to, to come across into it. But I know many people, for example, within the medical research community who you know, are obviously very supportive of the idea of there being a, a fund and its, and its longer term benefit, uh, but who were quite uncomfortable with the notion that the money was coming out of primary health care uh, as a way of funding it. So I think as a um, Any time you're arguing for an idea, you do need to have a think about what all of those sorts of consequences are. I think one of the problems that the Medical Research um, Future Fund uh, can suffer from, and I think this is where, well, in part because it came out of the blue, let's be br brutally honest, in the last budget, uh, where people, if they want to have a more rounded vision of this going forward, need to think through is, first of all, you know, what are going to be the sources of revenue that are going to flow into it? When are they going to flow? Obviously, that's much easier when the budget uh, generically is in surplus rather than uh, at times when it's in deficit, as it will be at least for the next uh, few years, most likely. Um, but you also need to have a think about what implications does this have for uh, research funding more generally. I mean, if you're stealing money effectively from one part of the research community and putting it across into medical uh, research, if that's being done on merit, I don't think anyone's got a problem with that, but if, but if that's simply occurring because of uh, political considerations, well, that's not really, I think, in the long-term uh, interests of uh, research and science. I'd also say, too, that when you're, when you're putting all of these sort of um, uh, components together, you need to have a think, too, even within the realm of medical research, which is that if government's got this big fund that it's going to fund research from in future from, is it starving the sector of funding today in order to fund that? And that's, I think these are all quite legitimate considerations that need to be had. I, I think the idea of a, of a medical research fund under the right set of policy conditions is a very worthwhile one to do. But sometimes I think you know, a common mistake that people can make is that they, they, they see their little goal and aspiration and sort of charge towards that moment of light without thinking about all of the consequences and the policy knock-ons of a particular, particular idea. And unfortunately, I think uh, this fund, while I think it will survive and will inve inevitably invest in over time, um, is suffering a little bit of damage because the, the politics wasn't thought through carefully enough when it was first come up with. I'm going to say I think that this is your one opportunity in a lifetime to really use this fund and create the future that you really wanted to create. And I do think that there will be a future fund. I think there will be billions in that future fund already. It depends whether they choose to pay out incrementally or save up for that $20 billion milestone, which may take an extra one or two years. But I think the message I certainly got from the government speaking to the minister's place today <coughs> is that they are really committed to giving you this future fund so you can decide yourselves. I mean, it's as much as what you want to tell the government where it should put its money. Is it should, be, should it be in transformational science? And how much should it be in transformational science? And what projects are the priorities? And there will be a national conversation about what the, the priorities of this fund will be. I think it's a very exciting fund. I think the narrative coming out of the last budget was a disaster for the government. They should never have tied it to the GP co-payment. I had scientists as clients 
who desperately wanted to support the government on this future fund, and the government would say, go forth to tell those crossbenchers <coughs> how important this fund is for you, and therefore tell them to vote for the GP co-payment. And those scientists said, hand on heart, we cannot support something that we believe causes social harm. So the government made a mistake in the narrative, but the essential thing is you do have a medical science future fund that will never come around again. It was only a few years ago that Labor was going to cut out 400 million or so out of science, and you fought back and you, and you made that not happen. So I think that very much in this room, the power is to make sure the government gets the job done right, there is money going to be in that fund, make sure they stick to it and, uh, and not let you down. And only you can tell the government where you want that money to be spent. But don't be quiet on this one. Don't be wallflowers. Stand up for yourselves. So I think there's a key message there tomorrow that when you're meeting with MPs and senators that if the Medical Research Future Fund doesn't come up in discussion, it might be something you want to bring up in discussion. Um, is there a question from the floor over here, Katrina? There's an interjection. Of course uh, People there is. are being significant. Out of order. Way too polite. Way too polite. You need to get <laughs> on your feet and ask polite. questions. <laughs> Indeed. Now, these guys are experts, but there's no need to respect them. Um, look, I'd like to ask a question that I think has been raised through the general discussion already. Simon, are you telling this, this room full of people they need to become political animals? Because they're not all instinctively like that. And I'd be worried if I thought they went into those meetings tomorrow thinking they thought they had to think like Jeanette, like either of you. Can you both address that? Uh, well, the old saying in politics is that if you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu. It's true. Well, let, let's pull out that advice for tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to ask um, Jeanette, what is a good meeting with an MP and senator? What needs to go into making a good meeting? And Simon, what's a bad meeting? What can yeah. go wrong? Mm. Okay. What are the things to be wary of? Jeanette, the good meeting. I think a good meeting is where you walk out of that meeting having had your three points, the clear points put across and a commitment, a call to arms to that person you're meeting with and they've committed to doing something. Please, sir, will you write a letter to the minister to say that we want this future fund? Yes, I will. Thank you. Then you use that opportunity to follow up. That's a good meeting. I went in with a sci I mean, I know that science gets very complicated sometimes and it's very hard to dumb it down and it's embarrassing to try and dumb it down. And, but basically, the MP is not the brightest person in the room. You are. And it's your job to make sure your message gets convinced. And one of the things I'll just quickly tell you about, a, a, again, a, I don't know if they're in the room, but I won't name them, but I went in with a scientist who um, had a very complicated story to tell and a wonderful a device, and it was um, uh, to stop Parkinson's shaking. It was, a, I call it the deep brain device. But, and it, I'm sure that the, the word was much more complicated than that. And he actually showed a video of a man who was terribly shaking and he touched his, this device and he stopped and picked up a cup of tea. And the MP was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Now that, that was a good meeting. And out of that meet, all those meetings, hopefully something will come out of it. But, but be convincing and be emotional. Don't be, don't be boring and tell a technical tale. That's not what you, your MPs are there for. You go tell the bureaucrats your technical tale or Ian Chubb. For the MPs, be emotional. So Jeanette's advice is um, the MP is not the smartest person in the room, but my advice is don't tell them that. No. Simon. Correct. And look, Jeanette's right. I mean, these meetings are ultimately transactional. They're there to achieve an outcome, even if it's only a process step. So that's really what, uh, what you want to try and achieve. Uh, what's the opposite of that? Well, you go in, you spend, you know, uh, half an hour or an hour having a really pleasant cup of tea. You wander out. They don't remember who you were or what the meeting was about, and you can't tell anyone what you actually got out of the meeting. Yep. I mean, and the reality is you probably won't get back in that door again be, unless they, you know, enjoy having a cup of tea with you. Uh, because the reality is most MPs are time poor. Uh, they've got very busy schedules. They've got things that they've, they are wanting to progress. And if they don't see that there's something that comes out of this meeting for them in that transactional sense, well, why are they going to bother to meet with you again? We, we are coming to the questioner at the back of the room, but um, I suspect our two panellists have had occasions where the meeting gets cancelled at the last minute, the meeting commences, the bells ring, the yeah. MP or senator goes, um, some big event happens on the day and the whole lot is called off. What's been um, perhaps your worst um, war tale from all of the effort and all the preparation that went into uh, something and, oh my goodness, it didn't work? I think the New Zealand air earthquake was a bugger for me because we had spent weeks and months getting all these petitions together for this organisation. We had the Prime Minister, in fact I think a Prime Minister spill was another one that was really bad too because I had all these great meetings with Julia Gillard and 
and everything was cancelled the, the night before. It was like, oh dear, something's going on. But uh, events like natural disasters, uh, political spills, you can't help those. They're the things that just happen in life. It's incredibly frustrating when you spent all that money getting to the parliament, you've put your petition together, you've thought you're through, you've done your infographics, and you know the buggers cancel on you or the bells go. But that's why it's very important when you walk into a room and you've got that person, get your message out in five minutes or less. And if you can't do that, then you've probably lost them because as Simon says, a long waffly conversation won't work. The bells go crazy and last parliament they were ten times worse. You really had literally five minutes before you probably had a bell ring. So don't spend time talking about the weather. We don't care about the weather. You want to say, thanks for taking the meeting. Now I've come to give you some solutions because you're not saying the word I want because as all you know, parents will tell children, we don't start the conversations with I want but you tell them you're here to help them with some good policy outcomes and it's cost effective. Cost effective is your absolute key buzzword. And I've got to say, uh, a disaster can be an opportunity. Uh, you often get that example exactly what Jeanette talked about, where you, know, you walk into a meeting, the bells start ringing, the person's got to get up and leave, uh, and you sit there and go, oh, why did we bother? Wasn't this a waste of time? Well, more often than not, they then feel obligated to you that they actually owe you a meeting at some point in the future. And, you know, look, I think Science Meets Parliament is a wonderful event. I mean, it is an event and the whole of Parliament knows that it's happened and that's why it's really important. But I reckon, you know, more often than not, the best meetings that you are ever going to have are not the ones that are done in Parliament House on a sitting day. They're either back in the uh, Member or Senator's uh, office or even better still, they come and visit your facility and you actually show them what you can do. So if a meeting falls over, Use it as an opportunity, use it as a piece of leverage to try and turn it into another opportunity to have a conversation and hopefully an even better one. Good advice without the invoice. At the back of the room. Hi, I'm Miranda Cumston from School of Public Health at Monash. Um, I have a question about, um, I guess, the, the, the interaction going in the other direction. So rather than uh, cases where we might be wanting to come to parliamentarians and say we need this action or this proposal and so on, I'm interested in hearing more about, about the frameworks that might be going on where parliamentarians who are working on underlying policy development might be seeking expertise and how that works. Um, you know, ideally, if you're going to introduce a new GK, GP co-payment, hypothetically, you <coughs> might speak to a health economist. Um, you know, what kind of frameworks are going on in the background where that sort of thing is going on, particularly where you don't perhaps have a department of public servants developing that stuff? Well, I'm going to add to that question. Is it parliamentarians that work on policy frameworks or does that happen somewhere else? Jeanette? I think if you can align, you've always got to think about, and, and uh, the previous <coughs> media panels also touched on this, you've got to align your agenda with the government's re-election agenda and the opposition's election agenda. Because if you're talking about something over here and they're thinking, oh my God, we're losing, we, we need a good health story. You need to align back to what they need to hear. And if you do that and make it, again, personally salient, make it a vote winner, it's got to be a vote winner or a red hot button issue. You can't be talking about something that no one else cares about. Um, and I think if you can do that, then you get their attention. You've got to understand that not all MPs are policy wonks, uh, but it would be helpful to know their background. I can tell you that uh, PUP Independent Senator Dio Wang is absolutely wanting to put science on his agenda as his issue. Now, while he doesn't hold the balance of power anymore, he's still a major player. That's an important bit of information to know. So if you're talking about him, he wants policy ideas. And policy ideas have to be very simple outcomes. They've got to be outcome focused. We don't want to have a policy idea that's a 12, tw 20 years in the making, which is half the time why climate change is always a bit difficult to, to get a, a, a clear outcome because it's just so fuzzy and means different things to different people. So align your agenda with the election agendas of both parties. Always understand that, um, give them information of how they can use that information. Uh, market research is always good, proper good research. They don't care about the stuff that has to go to the PBAC. They care about stuff that voters care about. So make it personal. I mean, you might have a structural problem about funding, but put it in an emotional context. Uh, yeah, look, I agree with that too. Look, the the, the key issue here is that if, if you only ever go to um, a politician with a problem, particularly if you go to them one which doesn't have a solution or not one that they can readily deliver, then they're not going to be much help to you. 
in that very transactional sense that we talked about a little while ago. Whereas if you go and actually try and help them understand a problem, so you know a major debate is coming up about a particular area of policy and, they, and they're already starting to, you can see from the fact that they're talking about it or they're reaching out to people or a parliamentary inquiry has been established, then reach out to them and offer to give them some information, give them an insight that they don't currently have. You won't change all of their minds, but you might change some of their minds. You might at least get them to answer some questions. And of course, particularly in modern political parties, it's not just the politicians themselves. Uh, you know, major political parties, at the very least, have a dedicated policy staff who are constantly running around and looking for useful information, useful insights that they can bring to bear to particular debates. So, you know, if you don't know who the relevant policy advisor is in the, in the various offices, then you should try and find out who they are. Make sure you've got a relationship with them. Don't hassle them to death with loads of information mm. they can't understand, but have a conversation about how you might be able to help them do their job. And if they like that, the answer is they'll respond and you'll be more influential with them. A uh, question in the back of the room. Uh, Mark Hutchinson, uh, Centre for Nanoscale Biophotonics, University of Adelaide, STA board member and uh, Medical and so uh, Cognitive Sciences Cluster Rep. Um, lots of titles. Um, we have uh, in science the issue that our science sausage takes 7 to 14 years to sizzle. How do we actually keep the, si the, the politicians engaged in this topic that is going to outlive their p potential career uh, and obviously potentially term. Uh, and how do we keep them engaged in that process and let them enjoy some of the sizzle along the way? Perhaps become vegetarian, but for a serious <laughs> answer. I think, there's, I think you've got to take the, take the politician or the, the decision maker on the journey with you. Uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll have to cite the Bionics Institute, who um, I think there's more than just one-on-one -on -one meetings. Bionics Institute invited the, the, the politicians from all parties into their, into their on-site to talk to the scientists because the actual device that they want to have seed funding for is still five years off down the track, so there's not even anything to even show them. But I think you've got to take them on the journey, show them, get them on-site, introduce them to scientists, go find your community of people who will benefit from what you're working on, whether it's patient groups or whether it's, you know, whether it's the environment. Take them and realise that this is not just a long-term issue you're working on, that you need their engagement now. You know, host to parliamentary morning teas and their electorates and invite the whole community and stakeholders around you. I think you've just got to make it as interesting as possible. And also, s politicians are interested, but as Simon said, they're very time poor. So you've got to make it relevant. Why do they need to know about your stuff now and not later? And what's the cost to them if they don't? So, I mean, isn't politics itself a bit like science in that it is a cycle, it's, it's ongoing, it's not instant and momentary? It's not particularly methodical. No. <laughs> <laughs> Although it can be, too. I mean, increasingly political parties are using very sophisticating uh, polling and sampling techniques to be able to identify uh, king you know, key voters, uh, key constituencies, how they talk to them, all of those sorts of things. Uh, you know, there is a, there's definitely a science at, at, at that level. Uh, but science by its nature is a lot more organic, I guess, in terms of the way in which, uh, in the way in which it operates. Look, the, the reality is, is that not every politician is going to be interested in your issue, and I don't think you should try and, try and pretend that they will be. Uh, as Jeanette has, has said earlier, you, know, you try and find the ones who are interested and try and keep up a conversation with them. And don't forget about their power to have uh, conversations with, with their mm. colleagues as well. But one of the really important things in any good advocacy strategy is, is that you are always going to stand up, or you should at least stand up, uh, and if you're not standing up, you're not doing your job properly, but you should stand up for what you believe in. But then the real power in politics is who are the people who aren't you who are going to stand alongside you and say that this matters, because mm. that's the thing that politicians really notice. They expect everyone to act in self-interest. They expect them to put forward their case uh, for their particular issue. But who are the people who are a little bit unexpected who are going to stand up and say, actually, this really matters, and that's why you should support uh, this, this or that particular scientific research? They're the things that people notice. It's those surprising voices who are prepared to stand up uh, and back you in they're the ones, in, off, more often than not, who are the most powerful. Uh, Alan Williams from the National Computational Infrastructure. Um, you're talking about standing up and leveraging other people and conversations. 
Where do state politicians fit into this? And is there advantages to engaging with them to influence the federal? Mm. I think, well, look, I think it depends on your issue. If you have a funding issue that requires state buy-in as well, of course, they become a very important stakeholder. They can also be supportive to you if, like, an there's an election campaign going on. You might have noticed in New South Wales. It's too late if you haven't done anything about it now. But, you know, you'd want to get, if you want funding from them, you, you do a wish list, you know. Will you back me? Uh, which party will back me? And, and if they back you, you say, we'll, we'll promote it on our website, we'll tell our stakeholders, and guess what, you might get more votes out of it. They're very clever sort of political plays to make. You've got to be careful that you're doing it well. Um, but it depends. I mean, there's no point talking to state government if your whole issue is with the federal government. But they're not a bad stakeholder to, to deal with. You should be dealing with a whole range of stakeholders. Um, in fact, when you come to Canberra, you should have the support of your local state member as well, if that's if you're a location type organisation. Um, knowing who your local MPs are, state and, and federal, is very important. We always do electoral analysis for clients. Um, it's a bit hard sometimes, but you know, like if you, again, I'll do the Parkinson's. If you're developing a, a great breakthrough medicine, Parkinson's, it's helpful to know where they live. Where's the, 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 you know, do most Parkinson, you know, high level of Parkinson's people <coughs> live in South Australia? Or do most melanoma sufferers live in Queensland? You know, having that information helps when you're talking to your state MP or your federal MP. Oh, and, and don't forget that, you know, particularly in major political parties, you know, the state MP is either the best friend or oftentimes yeah. the worst enemy of the federal MP as well. I mean, their, their, their political fortunes are often uh, inextricably linked. Um, and when it comes to really grassroots level, you know, yes, you know, one tier of government or other might be a decision making or more relevant to the decision making, but, but don't think that the impacts of policy decisions aren't important. So yeah, as Jeanette said, like, you know, if you've got a facility and it's location based, it should matter to the state MP how well, uh, you know, that organisation is funded by the federal government. Uh, because that's jobs, that's opportunities, that's you know that, that's a fantastic uh, benefit for that uh, that community just in that area alone. Uh, but I can tell you, you know, when when MPs and increasingly as they're having to do, are having to get out and engage, if you're going out and door knocking, you don't, you know, the person who answers the door when you're an MP and you go door knocking doesn't care whether you're a state, federal, or local MP. If they've got a problem, they're going to tell you about what's on their mind. They're going to ask you for help, and a good local MP, no matter what tier of government they're involved in, even if they're not the one who can solve that problem, will put you in touch with someone who can help you. Yeah. That's good service, that's what good MPs do, and that's why I think you should work those networks too. We haven't spoken today about the role of the public service. Um, are good ideas um, percolated within government departments? Should effort go into no. talking to government departments? I'm hearing the giggling already. I'm saying already. no, he's saying yes. I say, <laughs> I say the, only, the only power of a public servant is to say no, and that particularly is health bureaucrats, I think. Um, look, they're, they're, I, I, I work really well with Treasury and Finance, and they are because they have been out in the real world. I find bureaucrats particularly, I hate to say it, and I hope you're not in the room, but um, you know, some, some health bureaucrats can be very dogmatic and they, they like to think that they can run interference between your, you and the minister and sometimes they like to thwart the minister. Um, a lot of bureaucrats get a little, little power crazy um, and some are really good, but I think you have to cultivate them. You have to get, I mean, you know, in a minority government, it, is, it was much more important for, to, for the ministers to rely on their department because they didn't have the opportunity to get it wrong. Uh, when the government's got a little bit more opportunity to make mistakes, then the bureaucrats are not so tied to the ministers. But a good bureaucrat will make sure that their minister is protected and looked after. That means also they may not let you get anywhere near that minister or they may block your ideas. So never take no for an answer from a bureaucrat. Um, yeah, look, coming back to that analysis which I kind of started with about the coals and woolies of uh, political parties, the reality is, is that uh, the bureaucracy once upon a time really was the source and font of all knowledge. You know, they were the monopoly <coughs> provider, if you like, of the service. Uh, well, they're clearly not that anymore. The policy advice around government is far more contested um, and, uh, in fact, the public service now is, is I think, starting to think more creatively about how they're going to come to grips uh, with that. So they want to reassert some influence around government. They actually do feel, when you speak to many senior public servants, that they've lost influence 
in a material sense that government goes and listens to you know, this or that lobby group or this or that think tank uh, more often than not when it looks for new ideas. Uh, I'd actually say there's a Perversely, there's an opportunity there at the moment with some public servants who are beginning to you know, understand the more dynamic environment, the more contested environment that they're working in and are looking to build relationships. The smarter ones cert certainly are. Now, you've got to take them on an individual basis because, as Jeanette said, some of them can be very defensive and just end up saying no. But I do sense that that, that point is starting to change, that some public servants are becoming more creative about how they how they engage uh, with the wider uh, community and interest groups, how they try and connect up various different, I guess, lobby groups and uh, think tanks and those sort of things to help support uh, their initiatives. Um, but uh, the key power still of a public servant is to find a reason not to do something rather than a reason to, to do it. We'll take what might be our final question uh, from the middle of the room. Um, hi, my name's Claire Krauss and I'm from the Australasian Quaternary Association. Um, we study past climate changes and my question is to do with when your science is already a political issue. So if you go um, as a climate scientist to an MP, it is already political and what you say is going to be um, marred by the political stance of the MP you're speaking to. Um, how do you deal with that? I would, um, if, if you know you're going in to a non-believer I think you have to be honest. Say, look, I know that you don't believe in climate change, but I'm going to tell you something that I think may change your mind. Or I'm going to give you some information that I want you to think about and act on. Or I want to hear your views about why you think that, this, that, that what I'm about to say is not right. I mean, I think you need to confront them quite up. I mean, frankly, if you're going in to see Cory Bernardi, I don't reckon he'd probably take the meeting. But if you do get in before Cory Bernardi and he just sits with his arms crossed sort of huffing at you, you say, I understand where you're coming from, but what I'm about to tell you is quite extraordinary. And here's the evidence, and here's my short piece of data, not my long, waffly lecture. And give a, give a personally salient an, uh, example. Talk about what uh, an issue that's happening in his electorate that's happening to Rivers, or you know, make it personally important to him. I think the problem with the climate change debate is that the punters out there right now, I'm not saying they haven't always, don't care. And there was a research uh, piece of work that came out only yesterday from JWS Research, uh, True Issues. It put environment down as the number seven issue that people care about. Not only was it seventh issue that people care about, but it was seventh issue. It was right down on how the government was performing on that issue. And Jeanette, what was, for this audience, what was number one, two, three? What should uh, this audience be aware of? The first one was economy. So if you're going to talk about science, make it about the economy. The second one was, uh, I think, um, health and... Um, health, education, community affairs. So talk about the health issues connected to science, to climate change. And then it came down to national security issues, which again, you can make a, a, a very strong national security issue out of science. So you've got to make it relevant to those points because the government knows that the voters don't care about climate change in this political cycle. This cycle is all about the economy right now. Um, you know, years ago when, when Kevin Rudd, he came in on a wave of climate change. That was different. Plus. Uh, you know, there were burnt lawns in everyone's front yard. So it was something they could see and taste. But uh, I think, you know, unfortunately, you've got to make it aligned to what the issues are that the voters are looking at, and they're looking at the economy first. Concluding comment? Yeah, I mean, the point that Jeanette was making was right. I mean, if you go back to 2007, something very significant happened, is that we weren't just having a drought in this country, we had an urban water drought in this country. And that made climate change seem real to people even though, of course, that was as much as anything a part of the natural cycle influenced by climate change. And, of course, we've been through a period where, you know, essentially, it's, you know, we haven't had droughts. We're about to go back at some point into a period where that will become relevant again. And it'll be relevant whether or not it's just a drought in the bush or whether it's drought in our cities as well. So the state of infrastructure and a whole range of things will come into it. Look, I think Jeanette's right. You have to really pick the politician and understand where they come from. As she says, like a Cory Bernardi or a Dennis Jensen is never going to believe you if you just say this is all about climate change. They've got a different view. But, but don't think that those politicians don't understand that there are impacts that are going on uh, and that science measures those impacts. So they may not want to tie it up in a broader discussion about climate change, but if it's having an impact on a local community, a water source, or something like that, mm. 
they may nonetheless be interested in what practically can be done to remediate that problem. They're not going to be interested in an emissions trading scheme, but they might want you know, sort of direct action, for want of a better word. They might want something more tangible and pragmatic that can be done about that. So don't assume that people necessarily have a, a closed mind to science and the way in which it works. It's just whether or not they happen to link it up with a wider debate um, about a particular solution to climate change. And I think it's also, just quickly to finish that off, that point off, it's really important to make the voters care again about it. And that's about finding the issues that they do care about. I mean, so just, I mean it's all voter-led, mm. as um, you know, this panel knows, that if the, if the voters do care about climate change, some of those sceptics will start moving towards your, your position. So we've got to make the voters care again. So friends, in summarising what I hope has been a useful panel discussion today, prepare yourself for the unexpected when you meet your MPs and senators mm. tomorrow. Be sure to align what it is you want to communicate to what the audience itself is interested, what is relevant to their local electorate, what's relevant to the political cycle, and what's relevant to the economy, to health, and to education. Those top three issues that remain consistently the most important factors that voters change their minds about when they go to the election. But if there was perhaps one really important message to come from this discussion today, it was that in an environment where there is a contested policy um, advice environment for governments where the public service is not always the only trusted source. There's an opportunity for you to organise your thoughts about providing advice to government at the right time and the right points in the political cycle. I hope our discussion has somehow helped in those considerations. Please thank Simon and Jeanette and thanks very much for having us. Thank you.